Well, good morning, church family. Well, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, We're trying some things out, but we're going to sing to the Lord a new song. He is worthy of new songs, amen? He's worthy of doing things different for. But as always, let's begin with the right way, preparing our hearts for what God is going to do in our time of confession and forgiveness. Would you join me in a prayer? Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I ask that you join me in prayer and meditation. Prepare your hearts for our service together. This time, I invite our kids to come forward for a special kids' message.
Well, how's everybody doing today? All right, so I want to share with you a little bit of what I'm going to be teaching the grown-ups here in just a minute, okay? So, Jesus tells us in the book of John, you know the book of John, one of the four Gospels? Jesus said to them, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. All right, how many of you get hungry? I see three young boys here. That's, those hands should be a lot higher up. That's right. That's right. We get really, really hungry sometimes, right? How long does it take you after you've eaten to be hungry again? 15 minutes? <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds about right, right? Yep. So there are all kinds of things that we can eat in this world that, that leave us hungry again in just a few moments. But Jesus tells us here in this passage that he is the bread of life, right? And then in him, we will never be hungry again. Now, do you think Jesus is talking about our stomachs? No. 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 Yeah, so we just be hungry sometimes, right? It just happens. So, is Jesus talking about feeding our stomachs or feeding our, what do you, what do you think Jesus is talking about feeding? Heart. Our heart. That's a good one, right? Feeds our hearts, feeds our souls, right? So, how do we think we can get Jesus in there? And it, it feeds our brain. It's good. Okay. That's right. So we believe in him and we learn about him. That's right. So when we want to feed our souls, we go to God's word, right? When we want to feed ourselves on the bread of life, right, we go to God's word. And you want to know the best thing about that? You can never have too much of it. And if you want seconds, you can have them. If you want a snack, you can have it (laughs) anytime you want. Does that, does that ever happen in your own homes? Can you be like, I want a snack whenever I want it? Is that, is that, do moms and dads do that? You can have a snack anytime you want? Okay. There is a limit to that, isn't there? Yep, yep, yep. But if you ever want to snack on God's word, if you ever want to just hear a couple of verses, just a little, little nugget, right, to get you going just a little bit further, I'm pretty sure your grown-ups would be more than happy to let you have a snack in that way. Right? So, when we go to God's word, when we fill up on Jesus, right, we'll never be hungry again, even for growing boys. Right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the way that it feeds us and sustains us, and we thank you for the promise of knowing that in you we will never be hungry again. Lord, there are so many things in this world that make us hungry uh, time and time again, but Lord, in you we are satisfied, and uh, Lord, we just thank you for the way that you help us to grow. We pray over these these young people, Lord, we pray that you would just um, teach them something new about you today, and Lord, that you would feed them in a way that they will never hunger again. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are very blessed. Uh, Personally, my family, we're very blessed, but we're blessed in this church. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, I I am overwhelmed with blessings, Lord, and and Lord, we thank you uh, for those blessings. We thank you uh, for this church, for the family that you've put here in Stilicum. At this time, Lord, these men and women, and Lord, most especially these children, um, it it fills our hearts, uh, and you give us such joy in that, Lord. Lord, you're there in the joyful times, and you're there in the hard times. And Lord, we know that uh, there are hard times too. We have, we have people in this very family, in this very church, uh, who are going through hard times. Some who are recovering from surgeries and illnesses. Some who are going through difficult financial situations, different uh, uh, interpersonal um, problems. Uh, Lord, I don't know... Th- I don't know a fraction of them, but Lord, you know each and every one. You know every detail that makes up uh, the struggles, Lord. You know uh, all sides, every facet. You're there the whole time, Lord. And, And what I ask humbly is that, Lord, in those hard times when things are a struggle, we feel you, Lord, that we know you're there, that we turn to you, that we look to you first, 
Uh, we so often look to you as a last resort almost, and Lord, I ask that you help us to see you are the first resort, you're the only resort, and that by looking to you, we see all, uh, all things through that lens, uh, Lord. Father, I pray over the, the members of our congregation who are not with us this morning, the ones who are traveling, Lord, but Lord, I pray for the ones who are, are with us in uh, this, these amazing miracles of this time, Lord, the ability for people to join us for worship around the area, around the country, around the world, Lord. We don't know where this message is going to go. We may never meet some of these people, uh, and yet, Lord, they are our brothers and sisters too. So I pray for those men, women, and children as well that, uh, that, that your message, your word reaches them uh, through the tools that you've given us in this era, Lord, um, and we should look at those as, as blessings as well. Lord, I ask now that, that you hear, as myself and our congregation, we pray together in the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, we've given you a little bit of a preview. I want you to go ahead and join me in opening your Bibles to the book of John. We're going to jump straight in. We're going to pick up where we left off. If you remember, last week we were talking about uh, this disciples' response to this miraculous work that Jesus had done. So we're going to pick up to verse 22. Jesus is going to make a profound statement as part of this section that we're going to read here today. So if you've made your way there, the book of John, chapter 6, verse 22, would you please stand and join me for the reading of the word? <clears throat> On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, <clears throat> they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. <clears throat> then they said to him, what, what must we do to be doing the works of God Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the promises of your scriptures. We thank you for the hope that we are given in your scriptures. And we thank you for the way that you feed us and sustain us through your word. Lord, we ask that we would receive 
a healthy fill here today, that we would be filled overflowing in your spirit, in your word, and in your glory. Be glorified in us in this time here and now, and we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church family, you may be seated. <clears throat> so as I mentioned last week, we were looking at this response of the disciples to Jesus' miraculous work, this miraculous feeding of the 5,000, and what we saw was sort of they got their fill and then they, they left, right? They kind of went on without him. Let's take a look now in our passage today to see what the crowd did. What was different here about this? Verse 22 picks up, On the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. Now, did you catch the difference there? Did you catch the different response? Let me read that again. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, this is verse 24, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. You see, where the disciples got what they needed from Jesus and then went on without him, the crowds went seeking him. See the difference there? See, we are blessed in the fact that Jesus comes to where we are in our hour of need. He comes and he meets us in our lowest places in life, in the depths of our sin, in the depths of our lostness, where we were incapable of pursuing him on our own. He meets us there. And we're grateful for that. But we have to remember, he set us free. See, he removed the chains that bound us, and he gave us the ability to walk. More so than that, he gave us the freedom to walk in whichever direction we may choose. And as we see far too often, we don't often make good choices. I'm reminded of the lyrics of one of my favorite hymns. We've talked about it other times before. Come thou fount of every blessing. In one of the stanzas of that particular hymn, we say that we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. See, that's our natural inclination is to wander, to walk away, to not make the right choice there. This is our natural inclination and in many cases our heart's desire. This is the part that we have to address, that we have to change. We have been set free, first and foremost, of course, through Christ alone. We know this to be true. We cannot choose to unbind our feet from the shackles of sin that was not within our power. But now that they are unbound, now that we have been set free, we can choose where our feet will wander. We have to ask ourselves, do I wander toward Jesus or away from him? Jesus came to where we were, and now we need to go where he is. You know, when I think about things and where we go to find things, you know, I wouldn't go looking for precious jewels at a toy store. It doesn't make any logical sense, right? There, there's no reason for them to be there. Something like that is obvious to us. But I am constantly amazed at the number of Christians that I speak to who deliberately choose not to seek out Christian fellowship, and then they're surprised that they can't find fellow believers. You see, you're not going where they are. You're not looking where they ought to be. Now here, even at this church, we have multiple ministries and small groups and there are many more like them uh, that are not even part of this church. There are many organizations where Christians gather together to do kingdom work. If you're not connected with others who can edify you in your Christian walk, then, beloved, I've got to tell you, that's not on them for not coming to where you are. They're supposed to be pursuing Jesus, 
not you. Now we know that we certainly want to reach out to one another. That's something that we want to do. That's something that we ought to do. But our main pursuit is to Jesus, not to people. And we have an obligation to go where Jesus is. We have an obligation to go where his people are. And when we avoid that, we're not following the footsteps of Jesus where they lead us. What we find more often than not in our lives is we effectively do that thing that we did as toddlers where we just sort of laid down in the middle of the store. You know that maneuver? Every parent here knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? Where the, where the kid just goes limp and they want you to just drag them across a couple of aisles. Fortunately, we have a God that will sometimes drag us where we need to go because we do that. We just sort of lay down and wonder why our blessings are not coming to us. But Jesus calls us to follow him. And that means that he leads the way and that we go where he is, wherever that leads us. And it's not always an easy journey. It's not always going to take us to pleasant places. It may even mean that we have to walk away from some things that we like in our lives. See, in order to go where Jesus is, sometimes we have to leave someplace we don't need to be. Some place that might be comfortable to us. But it's not where Jesus is. And so we need to move away from him. Whatever it may be, whether it's an unpleasant journey, whether it's an unpleasant place, whether it's leaving something behind, it draws us closer to Jesus and is therefore worth it. And if you struggle with this, and we all have, maybe you're not struggling with it right now, but we have all certainly struggled with this in our lives. But if you are struggling with this, perhaps you've forgotten why you are following him. He tells us here in his text. Verse 25, we pick back up. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Even though they had done the right thing and followed Jesus, Jesus rightly points out something. They did the right thing for the wrong reason. Christian, I got to tell you, we can be guilty of that. We can do the right things for the wrong reasons. You see, they followed Jesus, but they were just looking for more bread. You see, if we only follow Jesus for his blessings, then your feet will cease to follow when the blessings stop. See, God blesses us time and time and time again, but sometimes these blessings are not obvious to us. Sometimes they're not the things that we asked for. And so we don't recognize the good things that God has given us. Sometimes the blessings that God puts in our lives are not even for us. And sometimes you were meant to be the blessing for someone else. See, God was using you to bless someone else. But because you didn't go there, you didn't see that that bread was for you, and so perhaps we didn't obey where God was leading us. Because we didn't go, another may have gone without. Another may have missed out on a blessing because we tried to keep what was intended for them. Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life. See, the things that endure to eternal life are often hard. It's because they're worth it. We see this time and time again in life. If it's easy, it's usually not worth it. The things that require the most work, the things that require the most dedication are the things that last. And our walk with Christ was never promised to be an easy walk. But he promised that he would walk with us every step of the way. He promised that he would lead us every step of the way. And so it may not be easy, but it's worth it. 
If we follow Jesus simply because he has blessed us with a sunny day, but won't follow him when he wants to navigate or to help us navigate the storms of life, then we've missed the whole point. We've chosen immediate happiness over eternal joy. We've talked about that sometimes before, of how we confuse happiness and joy. There is certainly happiness in joy from time to time. But joy is the contentment of knowing that no matter what it is that you're going through, it's going to be okay. And you can have joy without having happiness. And that's life sometimes, where we go through the difficult moments knowing that it's going to be okay. Because we have joy through Jesus. So what must we do? Verse 28 Jesus tells this. It says, then he, uh, they said to him, or they, they asked him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus then answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. We see this theme many, many times in the book of John. We've seen it many times already that we must believe. But this belief has to be something more than just simply knowing that Jesus can do something. It's not just an academic belief. The crowds had that. You see, they knew that Jesus could give them bread. They had seen it already happen once before. They knew this. We need to do more than just simply believe that Jesus can meet our needs. We need to trust that he will meet them. Even those that we don't see or recognize. Even those that we don't realize that we're missing. We have to find ourselves in a place where we turn to Jesus for every need and believe in him who was sent. But in order to have a right belief, we have to have a right understanding. Our text continues on. They said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread. From heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. They're doing something here that we do far too often. See, far too often we understand Jesus is sort of this conduit through which we receive every blessing. Now, to be fair, that's not wrong, but it's insufficiently right. Let me, let me say that again. It's not wrong, but it's insufficiently right. It doesn't recognize all that Jesus is to us. See, Jesus is more than just simply the one who gives us every good thing that we have. He is every good thing that we have. See, many people can give you bread, but only Jesus can give you life. The crowds here are trying to compare Jesus with Moses. They're thinking back to this time that they had received bread once before, not them literally, but the stories that told them of a time that bread had been miraculously given to them once before. And Jesus rightly points out that bread did not come from Moses, it came from God. See, God will use many different people in your life to bring you bread From time to time, he'll even use you to deliver bread to others. But the glory does not belong to to the delivery person. The glory does not stay with the messenger. In many ways, this was sort of the original contactless delivery. Have you noticed that? We've made an interesting cultural shift in so many things. We've gone to this no contact sort of thing. We've gone no contact with our food, and we've gone full contact with those who bring God's truth. And we sort of need to flip some of that. I don't know if you've seen how this happens. It's not just food. It's pretty much anything. People show up, and they ring the doorbell, and we wait until they're gone before we'll go out and pick it up. You used to greet them at the door, right? You used to... You didn't have to have a conversation, but you would at least exchange pleasantries, right? Like, have a nice day. Thank you, right? 
But now, the default is leave the product. I don't want to know you, right? In fact, sometimes, and I think they actually leave the car running, if I'm not mistaken. Like, they don't even ring the bell until they're on their way out. They're like turned toward, like, we have one of those ring cameras so we can kind of see it in action. They ring and run to the car. But in the two seconds it takes me to get from my chair to the doorbell, they're pulling out. They are gone. But when it comes to those who bring us spiritual food, we've gone full contact. You see, we cling to the messengers. I almost kind of wish it would be that no contact way when it comes to the scriptures. That we would overlook the messenger, that we would say, look, just leave the things of God. That's what I want. I don't need the person. I don't need the middleman. In this case, I'm talking about me. I don't want anyone to cling to me. I am no one. I want to bring you the word. I want to ring the bell, and I want to be in my car before you pick it up off the doorstep. Because it is Christ alone who brings you every good thing that you have. We put faith in people. People are not worthy of our faith. That's a different kind of faith that we have. See, our faith in people seems to fade the moment we don't get what we want. See, when we don't get whatever it is that we want, when we don't get what we're asking for, when we don't get what makes us happy, we go somewhere else. We find a different delivery person. See, this is the faith that the people were trying to put on Jesus. They were trying to give him that kind of faith. As long as he gave them bread, they were happy. See, he gave them this bread, but they were hungry for more signs. They wanted more and more and more. But Jesus corrects them. He says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus does not simply give us bread. He is the bread. He is the bread of life. He doesn't just feed our bellies. He satisfies our souls. And in him we will never hunger or thirst again. But church, we need to eat. We cannot refuse the nourishment of God's word and then act surprised when we're weak. We cannot allow our Bibles to gather dust from Monday to Saturday and then wonder why we're weary when it comes time for Sunday morning. Church, we should be in the word day in and day out. And like I was telling the kids earlier, if you need a snack, you can do that. This is the one kind of snack that as, as grown-ups, we can have all the time. We have to start cutting back on some of the other ones, right? Replace those, I'm speaking to me here, right? We just got off the tail end of, of Halloween, right? And so there was an abundance of candy that we are disposing of. I think instead of going for those little, they call them fun size now, right? There's nothing fun about getting less candy. But instead of reaching for one of those, right, what if we snacked on the Word? What if we actually consumed something that was of value? We need to think of Jesus less as food, to eat from time to time. We need to think of Him more as the air that we breathe. Day in and day out, every moment, He should be in everything that we do. He is the very air that we breathe. There is no part of our lives in which we say, I'm going to spend some time with Jesus here and then I'm going to go off and do my own thing and I'll see you again in a couple of hours. We take him with us everywhere we go or more importantly, as we've seen in our text, we go where he is. Verse 36, Jesus continues, he says, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, there's a wonderful message of hope in this. That in spite of our disobedience, in spite of our stubbornness, in spite of our pride, which again, you may not have any of those things, but I have them in abundance. In spite of all of those things, we are not lost. All that the Father has given to the Son will come to Him. It doesn't say may. It says will. Now, we may not know the time or the place when this will happen, but all who God has set apart for the Son will come to Him. And He goes on to tell us that He will never cast them out. See, there are two wonderful truths that we need to remember. The first of which is that there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And the second is that there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. You see, his love for us is complete. We didn't have to do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to lose it. He will never leave you nor forsake you. These are his words. And you have been entrusted to his care. See, the Father has set you apart and entrusted you in his care, and he will never lose you. A shepherd's greatest charge is to take care of his flock. Shepherds would count them as they leave the sheepfold. They would count them as they come back in. They would make sure that not a single one of them goes missing. In church, we have a good shepherd. We have the good shepherd. And not one of his flock can be taken from him. Because we are his from the first day until the last day. Let's go where he is. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you keep us and sustain us. And Lord, we want to be where you are. Lord, I pray that if we are avoiding the fellowship of other believers, if we are avoiding going where you would have us go, if we have been disobedient, Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts. Lord, if we are shying away from those difficult places of life, those difficult conversations, if we are shying away from being the delivery of a blessing because we are not the recipient of the blessing. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts. Help us to be used by you for your glory. Help us to be a part of your great work. Help us to follow where your feet may lead us and keep us from wandering where our hearts might take us. Keep our eyes ever on you. Because we know, because of the truth of your word, Lord, that your eyes are ever on us, watching over us and keeping us. And we thank you for that. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.